Okay, so Colossians 4, 2 to 6. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So, have you ever, have you ever missed an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody? Um, it was such a clear, open door, and yet you missed it. You didn't take it. You, you kind of, oh, I don't know. And you didn't speak up. Well, I, I certainly have, and, I, and I'm getting better at it. Um, but Paul is encouraging the believers to take every opportunity to share the gospel as they live it out and pray. And the big questions here are, how do we pray into gospel work? How do we live out the gospel? And how do we share the gospel? And these verses that I just read are for us. Now, recently, my wife had an opportunity to share the gospel with her student. Um, she's in her online English club. Um, this club is with a group of international students from Indonesia. And, um, where about? Oh, and that's a Muslim-majority country. She also meets with one of them separately for English tutoring, tutoring and life coaching. They were discussing the Islamic holiday after the month of Ramadan called Eid. And this Eid is like the secular version of Christmas. You know, gift giving, eating elaborate meals, visiting you know, family, you know, um, really nothing about anything else, but, but it's just a secular thing. Um, and as the discussion went on, the student was talking about praying for her deceased relatives. And Beth asked, so what are you praying about? And she, she said, so their sins would be forgiven. We would go to the cemetery and pray to Allah for, this, for their, the forgiveness of their sins. Now, at that point, my wife could have talked about the Christmas holiday and compared and all that. But what she did is she commented shockingly, and she can tell you this way better than I can, how, how, um, how different forgiveness of sins are in Christianity. And the student was very intrigued. And the student asked, how then do Christians get their sins forgiven? Well, that's a great... That's a pretty good opportunity, don't you think? So what did, what did Beth do? Well, she explained that Christian sins are forgiven by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. She went into a lot more than that. It was an amazing conversation. She was up on Zoom with this girl, and I'm down listening. It was, it was, it was great. And, here, and here, Paul here is encouraging the Colossians to pray for evangelists and take every opportunity they get to share the gospel as they live it out. I want to read those verses again to us just so we, we have it. Continue earnestly, this is uh, verse 2 in chapter 4, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us the door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest um, as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So th three things we're going to talk about today. Pray it, walk it, and talk it. And they're, they're the three, three main points of, the, of my talk, my sermon here. So just keep that in mind as we get into it. So in our verse, Paul gives excellent instructions on how to do just that. Uh, the Colossian church is a young church but growing well. And Paul's main concern for them or that they would remain complete in Christ, not, not be drawn away by false teachers and Jewish traditions and things like that, um, but that Christ would be supreme in their life. And in, you don't have to turn it, but in verse 118, it says, And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Now, preeminence is the idea of supreme that Christ would be supreme in their lives. He also wants them to remain complete or be perfect in Christ. And then in 128b it says that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, now the, the New King James calls, says it's perfect, but um, uh, some, other, some other translation called it mature or complete. And that's really the idea behind that word perfect. 
It's not like you have to be perfect. Um, but in Christ, you are complete. This doesn't mean that they don't have to grow as Christians. Growth is always important. But to stand, remain complete in Christ. And the formula is very simple. Without Christ, you're not complete. But with Christ, you are complete. It's just that simple. Let me say it again. Without Christ, you are not complete. But with Christ, you are complete. Paul is saying to the Colossians, all you need, all they need is Christ. You don't need some other tradition to fill up your faith. Christ only is all you need. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, today is the day to come to him and receive him. All you need, he is all you need to be clean, complete in him. The other thing is if you're here and you think you need, to, need something to be complete or do something more to be right with God, Paul says to the Colossians and to, and to all of us, Christ is all you need. Come to him today. Colossians need to just stay there, just remain mature, stand mature, complete, lacking nothing. They don't need to fill up to be complete by adding some false teaching or some works or some other things. Uh, so Paul wants the Colossians to understand that they are already complete. To stand until the end, lacking nothing. And that's really kind of, in some ways, the, the, the main point of the book of Colossians. But he, there's a lot of other really good stuff in there. Um, but I think that's what he's trying to get across to them. And then in, um, in chapter 3, 18, through 4, 1, are actual instructions on how to live in and under the Lordship. The instructions are all directed at the believers who are inside the church whether husbands and wives, parents and children, slaves and masters, we see here that Christ is Lord in all our earthly relationships. This is so that we please him as we serve each other. It's our response to him and his lordship. And if you look in, the, in that section, you'll see the word Lord and Master over and over and over again. And that's, and that's the point of that, is Christ is Lord. And now we turn to those who are outside, and this is where we're getting to our verse here. In verse uh, 4 or 5, it says, Walk in wisdom to those who are outside, outside the church, those who are without Christ, those who don't esteem Christ as Lord. And it's about us making Christ known to those outside. Take every opportunity to pray and live out and share the gospel to the world. And this is what we're talking about today. Pray it, walk it, and talk it. Paul's instructing, the, instructing Colossians for evangelism. And he has three strategies for it. And these things are, in some ways, interrelated. It's not like step one, two, three. It's, it's, you kind of go always back and forth to all of those things. So it's prayer, walking in Christ, talking about Christ. Pray it, walk it, and talk it. So I'm going to do this first section here. Verse 2, it says, and continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Pray it. So this is my first point. Take every opportunity to pray for gospel work. So pray for Pete and Jen, pray for us, pray for Cliff and others. Um, pick up our prayer cards. That's it's that, that's easy to do. Put it on your fridge, and every time you go for a drink, you can pray for us. Um, and this is about praying for evangelism. In particular, Paul's evangelism. He's asking for prayer. And we also know from, from uh, what chapter 128 in, in Colossians um, is, is about um, it's, hard, it's hard work. Paul is working hard to preach Christ. And it's, it's his, he says, it's, this is my calling, this is my passion, this is my work. I must proclaim Christ. Paul's serious about proclaiming Christ. Paul's asking for prayer for an open door to declare the mystery of Christ. His desire is that we would present the gospel clearly. Um, he wants them to be steadfast in prayer, continue earnestly in prayer, steadfast. Webster's defines it as not subject to change. Are we going to hang in there in prayer? 
Paul says, be steadfast in prayer. Continue earnestly in prayer. Let prayer be part of your lifestyle. Paul also talks about being vigilant in prayer with thanksgiving. And vigilant is like being watchful. So, so prayer isn't just closing your eyes and, you know, it's, it's be expectantly. Um, it's to be on guard. Don't fall asleep in prayer. Prayer is active. Be on guard. Um, be careful. Be carefully observant or attentive for God to move in your times of prayer. And be, fa- be thankful when he speaks and moves in and through your prayers. Meanwhile, pray also for us that God would open a door for us for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. An open door for the word. An opportunity is what he's talking about here. Paul is, is praying for opportunity, a chance to share the word, the gospel. And what is the gospel? And I'm always looking at, at it kind of like new ways to, to set it up or to, you know, to introduce to somebody. This is the one I just had heard recently. And it's, uh, you don't have to turn there, it's, it's 2 Corinthians 4, 5. And it says, for we proclaim not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. And Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the good news. That's the good news we want to we tell people. Jesus, the crucified Galilean history, Christ is the promised Messiah, Savior of the Old Testament, and Lord means divine and risen king over all. God's gospel celebrates how amazing Jesus is. Jesus is Christ our Lord. And the good news continues in what he has done. And Jesus is our Savior. Christ came as our King. Christ died for our sins. Christ rose to rule. And Christ will return to judge. The gospel is Jesus Christ is Lord. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to. Um, The idea of manifest is to make it clear. Um, so keep it simple. Jesus is, Jesus is Christ our Lord. Jesus is our Savior. Christ came as our King. Christ died for our sins. Christ rose to rule. Christ will judge, will, will return to judge. And uh, yeah, I don't like talking about judgment, but, but in some ways that's, that's what he's, he's, he's here to sort all that out and make it right. Um, I want to talk about love and, and all that, but we need to talk about Sometimes sin is something that needs to be dealt with. Um, and so we can't, we can't just pull that out of our gospel presentation, as hard sometimes it is. Um, and, that, and that's just the truth of the matter. And it's, it's, it's from the Bible. But just keep it simple in your gospel, um, gospel stuff. So I'm always learning to try to refine it at different angles and stuff. Um, and just keep it simple. Um, he says, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. And the ESV says that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak, clarity. Uh, we want to make it clear. We don't want to confuse people. Um, he is asking for prayer so that he would make it clear, be clear when you declare Christ, but declare the gospel in appropriate, um, that is appropriate to the hearer. And that's another, that's another piece where he's saying at the end, as I ought to speak. Prayer is, it plays a big role in evangelism. Prayer can align our hearts with God and thus help our gospel message to declare the mystery of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I just want to touch on one phrase in this section here, and, and it's, it's, it says, for which I am also in chains, and that's presumably prison. Um, why is Paul pointing this out here? Um, he's saying that gospel work, mission work, evangelism, is related to suffering. It's related to suffering. Suffering is part of the package. I don't think he makes a big deal about suffering. Some places he does, but rather he wants us to know that it will happen, and we need to be ready when it comes if we, if we engage in, in gospel ministry. Beth and I had our shares of difficulties and challenges in our missionary journey. We don't, we don't really highlight them. They don't make good missionary stories. Um, um, but we've had our illnesses and these and immigration issues. So the Hagues are having that right now. Conflicts with coworkers, deaths, and so on. Um, God has always been faithful, and it's about yay God in that. It's not about we struggle with something, but it was yay God. 
And, and it's about God's faithfulness. Well, we want to lift up God and say, yea, God, in, in our ministry and our work. That's what we want to say when we share the stuff from what we're doing. It's not what we're doing. It's what God's doing, um, and even in the midst of challenges. Uh, do pray for the missionaries. It's really important. Um, and there's more that shows up in the newsletter than, than, than you might think. Uh, pray, for our, pray for our evangelism. I just wanted to show you this list that, that, that Paul talked about in, in uh, Corinthians 11, um, 21 to 29. He says, but, but whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are, you, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offsprings of Abraham? So am I. 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. Am I, I am, I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less than one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. That means people throw rocks at you, just in case you didn't know. Um, Three times I was shipwrecked. Uh, for a night and a day, I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. That was from the ESV. Um, and I, I like that. Paul has anxiety. Paul has anxiety too. You know, I mean, it's pretty interesting to think about that. Um, but these are the things missionaries don't talk about. Because um, they're, they're hard. They're hard things to take. They are just part of the growth in the gospel work. Paul says, pray for our evangelism, for which we have some challenges. Take every opportunity to pray for the gospel and the workers. Pray, prayer is foundational for the work of evangelism, but also to tune your heart to God's heart. You too may find yourself wanting to join God's mission for those who are outside. Pray for gospel ministry and see what God does in your life. Many years ago, Beth and I started a, um, well, actually, Beth started a prayer, prayer group for missionaries in her, in her home. And, it's so, and I joined eventually, and, and it so attuned our hearts to God that we too had desire and call to go. The best thing that happened to me was going to the mission field apart from receiving Christ and marrying Beth. Mission work is great. Yes, hardships. Um, but if you want spiritual growth, get involved. Uh, the, the curve is steep, and there are challenges and suffering, but it's worth it. Just a quick story about, about prayer and evangelism. A few years ago, we had been praying to get involved in refugee work. Um, and and we, we had tried you know, to find connections, get involved, all closed doors. It was like crazy. Um, so when the pandemic hit, we moved much of our ministry online, which I talked about. And we also... Um, saw it as an opportunity to do some, some online learning. So we spent a lot of time learning. I did some Bible training. Beth did some skills on her English conversation clubs and classes and things. Um, and as a result uh, of Beth's connection, we were introduced to a person to pass on refugees that she had known in our area. And we started an, an online English, English club with refugees. Boom, just like that. In one week, um, in one week God made a way for us to connect with people from Syria Yemen, Iran, Kurdistan is amazing. Um, and they're all really sweet people. Um, it was amazing how prayer can open the door to share the gospel. And this one guy, um, I'll talk more about him at the, at the uh, cafe thing, but um, this one guy came regularly. And he was really keen to learn. And he asked, he asked me one time, if I come to your church, will they... Will they ask to see my passport to find out what religion I, I am? We're like, no, of course not, you know. Um, but that's what they do in, in, in the countries they're from. Um, so, so he was near where we lived, and I arranged for a time to meet him in person. 
And then the government moved them to a new location. It's still in London, which was great. So I drove, I had to drive to Needham rather than just taking the two, two stops. Um, this guy was so open to connect. We had coffee and chatted for, for a few hours. It was, it was a great conversation. He asked me questions like, what is church like? Then he asked, he asked, what is it like to be drunk? Now, I'm not going to tell you if I was able to answer that or not, but um, we had some good conversations, you know, and, and um, that was the range of, of stuff we were talking about. Um, he was a sweet and generous guy. He paid for my coffee. This guy's a refugee. He paid for my coffee. It was amazing. Um, and I had an opportunity, a huge opportunity, to share the gospel with him. And he was open to learn more. So I'm excited to come back and, and spend some time with him and, and, and tell him more about Jesus. Um, and pray, pray, pray the government doesn't, doesn't move him further away. Um, he, could, he could be up in, in Yorkshire or something. We'd, we'd be able to maybe connect him with somebody. But I'd like to hang out with him. He's a great guy. Um, so pray it. God will move. Uh, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Take every opportunity to live out the gospel. It says the Colossians are to walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Walking in wisdom is drawing on our ability to discern inner qualities and relationships. It's about insight and perception. It's understanding the situation. They are to live their lives with common sense. Walk here refers to their conduct in, in daily living, and it's about, it's about lifestyle. Um, I don't think the word outside, I think the word outside is a good picture for the lost. They're outside. They're outside. Think about in the wintertime what that's like. Outsiders are people who are not part of the church. They don't know Christ as Lord. They are unbelievers. They are the rest of the world. They are outside. Paul is, Paul is saying that the Colossians ought to, ought to live out the gospel to the lost world. Live as a child of the king. Let Christ be Lord. He then goes on to say redeeming the time. Um, or it's like making the best use of time. I don't think Paul here is saying the Colossians need to do a better job with their time management. I think it's more about take the opportunity. Um, and it's living wisely as they interact with those outside. Work hard, be honest in your dealings, showing they are, are worshipers of Christ, and take every opportunity to display Christ to the lost world. Hopefully, people will see us living the gospel out in their lives, and they'll have the opportunity, and then you'll have the opportunity to share it. Well, many years ago, it's a story from way back. Uh, many years ago, um, I had experiences. I worked as an architect, and one of my colleagues just came up to me one day and said. What does it mean to be born again? I love those questions. Aren't they great? I'm like, time for, I didn't have to, I didn't miss that one. I didn't miss that one. It was too obvious. Wow, what an opportunity. Um, so we, so he, we never really had any meaningful gospel conversation. Well, he, knew I was, he knew I was a Christian, and he may be seen how, you know, I work with integrity and things. I don't know. Um, I listened to him as he, as he told me that his brother was dying of colon cancer and had become born again. He didn't know what it was. I shared with him what it meant to be born again and the hope of Christ. Now his brother did die, and now in glory with the Lord. And I'm still talking about, about Christ with my friend. Hopefully he'll come, come to Christ one day. Also, I had, I had to work late that, that day to make up my work, because I was talking when I should have been working. Um, but it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, God provided a huge open door as I worked and lived as a Christian. And Paul here is basically saying, don't miss the opportunity God's provide in your normal daily life interactions. He then goes on to talk about the Colossians are to share the gospel. And let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. Take every opportunity to share the gospel. That's, that's ultimately the goal, that you can live it, but you want to... You want, to, you want to speak it out. You want to share it. You want to share it. You want to sh bring them to the word. Um, so what does, it, what does it mean, let your speech always be with grace? It is marked with kindness, courtesy, tact, and delicacy. It is also, is also characterized by charm, good taste, and generosity of spirit. So it's to be tactful, interesting, provocative, and responsive. 
And the way to do that is to be a good listener. What I found is, in some ways, your gospel speech should be more about you listening than, than you talking. And to find out about the situation, the person you share, you're sharing with. And then, and then you will know how you ought to answer each one. Show kindness, patience, and love to those who are outside. Be gracious as, as we learn to be better listeners. Um, let your speech always be gracious. It also says season with salt. I love salt. My doctor doesn't like it too much for me to have it, but um, it brings out the taste. And our gospel word should be tasty. Let salt, yet salt is not only used for flavor, but also as a preservative. The word shared about Christ can be life-giving to those who are outside. Let's be salty in our speech, Paul says, to bring Christ in the best light by making it relevant and attractive. And that's why I always learn new ways to, to share it, because everyone's different. Everyone's different. With, with our Muslim friends, we almost have to go always back to Genesis and talk about the original sin and, and, and try to establish that. Others, you can just, you know, go to one verse and boom, they're, you know, they're in, you know. But um, you just have to be, you have to be sensitive. Um, so be gracious and salty so we will know how to answer each person. And the gospel is not a one-size-fits-all. Yet there's some basic truths we need to, need to share and we need to learn them. But it's more about reading the person and the situation and responding in wisdom and grace. Are people asking us questions about Christ? Are we living as children of the King? Is Christ Lord in our lives? Can we clearly present the gospel in a gracious and salty way? People will ask. People will ask. We need to know how to answer each one. As we listen to them, and know how to respond. Our walk and our talk, it works together with wisdom and grace. Now back to my wife and her student, and how did the conversation go? So the student listened carefully to how sins can be forgiven, how her sin can be forgiven. My wife didn't push hard. She knew it's a, it's a challenge. And yet she explained the differences clearly, because that's what they were talking about and pointed to Christ. She was gracious to give her time to process that information. If you come to the London, I'm just pushing the London Cafe thing, um, she's going to talk about the next conversation she had with, with this gal. But seeds of the gospel continue to be planted. My wife will, will have more time to live out the gospel with this Indo young lady and more time to share as she listens and love this person who is outside but she is now starting to look inside. Isn't that great? Isn't that like, and you know, this, 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 this young lady, it was only her. We met her through, through some other connection. It was only her. And within a couple of weeks, Beth, Beth and her were just meeting together. In a couple of weeks, she started inviting all of her friends. She was a gatekeeper, you know, it was amazing. And so, so then we had this, now we have this, this, this uh, Indo-English uh, club with, with, with five, six people from, from a, a tough country. Um, so, how are we doing living out the gospel? Are we sharing when the opportunities come? Paul asked for prayer for his evangelism. Are we praying likewise? Are we praying that we would make the best use of time? Are we praying that God will help us be wise, gracious, and salty? Are we praying to make the gospel clear to each one? Opportunities are coming. Hopefully we'll be ready. And this other thought I just had, is, is evangelism optional? Can we say, well, evangelism isn't for me. Yeah, I, I really don't know what to say. Um, or some, maybe some other reason. Well, Paul doesn't think so, and neither do I. Um, I, think, I think there's ways you can do it. You can... You can pray it, you can walk it, or you can talk it. But I think we all can be part of it. We all can be part of it in evangelism. So Paul is telling the Colossians, the Colossian church, um, to go for it. Take every opportunity God gives you. And, and you got to remember, this is a young church in a Gentile area. Paul says, 
take the opportunities in front of you. Um, and there's no excuse not to be involved in evangelism. You can pray, pray for yourself and others. You can live out the gospel in your sphere of influence. And you can share the gospel clearly with God's power. Take every opportunity to pray and live out and share the gospel to the lost world. Christ is worth sharing to the world. It's good news. Remember that verse I said at the beginning, uh, 2, two um, Corinthians 4, 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Jesus Christ our Lord, that's it. That's the gospel. And if you want to receive Christ today as Lord, today is the day you can just you can do that. Come to me or I guess our prayer partners afterwards. Um, you can come talk to them and say, I want Christ in my life. I want to be complete in him. I want to pray and be part of the kingdom work. If that's you, you know, come up and talk to us. We'd love, we'd, love for you to, we'd love to pray with you about that. And pray and take every opportunity to live out and share the gospel to the lost world. Jesus is worth it. Get in the game. Pray it, walk it, and talk it.